Hello and welcome to another uh, episode of the Leader Campus Voices and uh, today I have with me Dr. Sylvia LaFerre, uh, CEO of Creative Energy Op Options Inc. I got it running off the page for some reason. Options yeah. Inc. Top global leadership guru, contributor to Inc.com, consultant, award-winning author, executive coach, you have it all. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> At least on paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's start out. Why do many people have uh, weak interpersonal skills? Because that's what you talk about a little bit on your LinkedIn page is weak to interpersonal skills. So how, uh, why do pe many people have these weak interpersonal skills? Well, I, I'm going to start by telling you a story of how I got involved with this, and okay. this is kind of the baseline for me. So I grew up as a kid in a family business that was fiscally very sound, but emotionally bankrupt. Uh, my father and his two brothers had a fairly large business doing silk flowers and, you know, all the stuff you see everywhere. Uh, but they fought all the time. <laughs> and so as a kid, I would hear him coming home from work complaining to my mother. And I remember thinking, well, if this is work, I think I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't planning to do work. It just didn't look like fun. And there's a sad moment here, but it turns out to be okay for me in the long run. Uh, so one day my father came home and I heard him say to my mother, I'm done. I'm done. And they went out to dinner and came back. And in the middle of night, it was very prophetic. He died of a heart attack. Oh, gee. Yeah. And I was 14. And again, I saw work as the enemy. I saw my two uncles as bigger enemies. But it led me to begin to say, what's going on here? So I ended up becoming a family therapist because our family needed a lot of healing and that was the way I was going to do it. And then one day we were doing a program for parents whose adolescent kids were driving them nuts. So the room was packed. And at the end of it, one of the men walked over to me and it was very interesting. He said, will you come work with my senior leadership team? And I said, why? This was for families, right? I said, why? He said, they're fighting. I said, so what? <laughs> he said, <"It's> Sylvia, <laughs> you work with people that have to get along and these folks have to get along. And he said, is it really that different than the family? So I thought, you know what? I'm an experimenter. Let me go in. And I did. And I used everything I knew about how to work with family systems in this group, this leadership group. And things turned around and, and then word got out and suddenly I was working in big pharma, I was working in computer industries. And what I saw is, and this is the base of what I really want people to get, what we learned in our original organization, the family, is what we bring to our present organization at work. That make any sense? Yeah, surely yeah. does. Surely does. And and uh, in fact uh, a business should function even more clearly many times than a family does because there's so much uh, on the line and to some extent. Of course, in a family, it's on the line too because, uh, you know, you don't want the family to dis dissipate and, and break up. I mean, uh, there's a lot of problems with that, obviously. What, what, what do you think... Uh, Name some of just a few of the, of the uh, you have the worst invisible communication patterns. So what are these, some of these, at least uh, a few of the worst communication patterns you've seen in 30 okay, years? Okay, so I've years. pulled together, Mel, I've pulled together 13. I try to distill it down to five or seven because people don't like big numbers, but 13 was about the best I could do. Yeah. And in every family and in every organization, you will see these patterns. Okay. And one of them that shows up is the super achiever. You know, that's the me, me, me guy or gal. Mm -hmm. And often they came from families where they had to make up for some shame or sadness or something dysfunctional in the family by being the best and the brightest. So you see them at work and they will step over or on anybody to get where they have to go. Mm -hmm. Now, 
here's what I want to say. I'll tell you a few of the others in a minute, but this is the most important thing. If all I was going to do was name the patterns, it's hello, my name is, and I'm a super achiever, or here's Sylvia, drama queen, it wouldn't have been enough for me. But what I saw was taking that same energy and transforming it into what I call its positive opposite. All that energy that the super achiever uses to be me, 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 they can become fabulous creative collaborators once they get the shift. See, okay. does that make okay. sense? Yeah, yeah. So that's one. Another one that everybody groans about is the procrastinator. <laughs> and that's the, it'll, you know, it'll, it'll, it's either the dog ate my computer. Or <laughs> I swear to God, I had somebody once say who came in late, they slipped on a banana peel. And I went, <laughs> you've got to be kidding, deadpan. So I never knew if it was true or not. But the procrastinator is often in a family where there is a super achiever, the me, 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 wonderful one. And they end up becoming afraid to finish anything because it'll never be good enough. Mm -hmm. So they just wait and wait and wait and wait. I have not found a lazy procrastinator. I have found fearful procrastinators. Mm -hmm. But what happens is once they get where it came from and begin to shift it, they become what I've named a realizer, where they can just kick ass and you know, go through it and get it in on time or even early. Now, there's the, in, in family, everything that I've read and in, in, in looking at some psychology and sociology, which is rather little, but uh, there, you know, there's this, this discussion constantly about order the order of, of in line that you are of the, of the rotation of the, of the sons and daughters. Is there something similar in the business world for that, for people who are hired earlier than others and, and therefore they're almost like in an order as well? Yeah, good. That's a good question. Did you know no one's ever asked me that before? Hey, hey. So you get kudos for that. <laughs> yeah. um, the answer to that is yes. You know, the, the special ones often come in earlier and um, – become the favored children, if you were, the, like the older children. Uh, but then sooner or later, some of these other patterns show up because you're working in a context of many people. So, um, and I'm going to share mine just so you know. I mean, I mean, we, I can make a case for all 13, for all of us. Yeah. And on our website, on www.ceoptions.com, you can take a leadership quiz to see what your patterns are. Oh, wow. So I, I, I'm oh. going to challenge you to take it and then take, yeah. and let me know. Okay. What it, it's fun. It's 13 okay. questions. It's pretty quick, but it's very accurate. Okay. So mine, I grew up with an older brother. So we're talking about he was there first who I think when he was three, he said, I'm going to be a doctor. And it was, you know, my son, the doctor was going to, and he did, he became a, a wonderful doctor, but he was always front and center. Uh -huh. And I was just the cute little girl, you know, you pat me on the head and I'm supposed to just be quiet. So if I wanted attention, I would have a hissy fit. I love <laughs> that cat, by the way. I'm sorry. That's frisky. That's uh, our cat. Beautiful, beautiful uh, cat. My, my wife and, and daughter are off on a trip to, uh, to uh, Portugal and Spain, they wow. have. She's a professor at Drake University, right. and uh, and Frisky uh, is uh, is. I'm going to get her down, <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's just Frisky. Uh, <laughs> that's how that's how informal these uh, <laughs> these interviews are. But uh, uh, they're they're at Drake University, where she's a professor. Uh, they have what they call a J term, which is a two week type of thing. And the classes are every day instead. So some of them take, uh, some professors take them on trips. And for the last two years, my wife took her, uh, put, took them to uh, Rio because she's Brazilian from uh. Rio and took them down to Rio. And then this year she decided that they were going to uh, Spain and Portugal instead. So my daughter went with them because she's been to Brazil several times, but never been to Spain and Portugal. So they went with her. So I'm batching it here. And that's why Frisky jumps up because she's uh. getting attention. Well, so. she's getting, she has a friend at home. So that's, <laughs> and 
and <laughs> Portugal is great. So yeah. anyway, so yeah, you know, so you know, we'd sit at dinner, and my brother could say tomorrow's Thursday, and my parents thought, oh my God, that's brilliant. And then I would say, well, tomorrow's Thursday, and the day after that is Friday, and they go, isn't that cute, right? <laughs> So if I wanted attention, I learned how to do a hissy fit, Academy Award hissy fit to get attention. And here's where we started. My husband and I worked together. And as we began to develop these patterns, we just paid attention. And here's what happened one day. Uh, I was at a meeting in the morning, uh, facilitating a meeting and something happened. And I kind of banged my hand on the table and said, now that's just ridiculous, right? And I heard two people on the side go, oh, she becomes so dramatic. (laughs) So I left the meeting thinking, what do they know, right? Yeah. Later in the day, I'm at another meeting, different group of people, different circumstances, and I knew not to pound my hand on the table. So I put my hands in the air. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, that won't work. And somebody, as we walked out, said, Sylvia, you have to be so dramatic. I mean, it was more than just raising their hands. I was Uh, in a tirade about what was going on. Anyway, that's the second time. The third, that evening, my daughters were in college at the time, and one of my daughters called to tell me something. And I said, Julie, that is absolutely ridiculous, and blah, 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 blah. She said, Mom, when you get that dramatic, nobody can talk to you, so how about if we hang up and I'll talk to you another time? Clink. Wow. Wow. And I looked at the phone and I said a few words to the telephone that were <laughs> particularly nice. But I went and I said to my husband three times in a day, am I really that kind of drama queen? And he looked at me, he said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm glad you're finally naming it. So that was one of the patterns we had. Now, the drama queen or king, and there are just as many kings as there are queens, transformed becomes a good storyteller. And that's what I've done. I've taken all that drama to put it into stories that have meaning, meaning so that when I work with a group, I'm taking them somewhere in a positive way. Now, when you do stories... Is that a great way for leaders to get points across in many cases that people can remember stories much better than they can directives of some sort? Absolutely. 200% exclamation point. Story is the root to the, from the mind to the heart. And story is as old as mankind. Yeah. The key here is what stories are you going to tell? Like the super achiever until they transform, we'll just tell stories about themselves. Mm-hmm. We have, you know, plenty of people in, in, in politics who use that as a way of getting where they need to. Me, 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 me. Um, but story is, is it's the humanizing of who we are. And one of the books I wrote is called Unique, How Story Sparks Diversity, Inclusion, and Engagement. Oh, wow. And it's about, and I've used this so many places where you go in, we don't really know each other, you know? Yeah. I mean, you look like a cool guy and you're sitting <laughs> there. You know, there's a history and, and lots of, of generations that came to form mm-hmm. who you are. As I would get to know you more, it would, it's what creates trust and makes us work together in a more effective way. So I really believe that, that, you know, and stories can be short. I think it's important and pointed to, to make a point, and then they're wonderful. Uh, can people who have, this might be a strange question, but do people, there's so much talk about the emotional intelligence. Uh-huh. Uh, do people that, do you think emotional intelligence, first of all, is, is kind of a valid uh, uh, area? Oh, and I think Dan Goldman, he's, he's an yeah. amazing human being. Okay. He, he himself is a deep, deep thinker, and he, he broke it open so that the soft stuff was no longer pushed aside as nonsense. So you think people who have, then, a great understanding of emotional intelligence can use that to tell better stories or to use them for better examples? I think that we learn how to distill out what the essence of a story is. The more we understand 
how we live and work in a context of relationships. And, and that's, this is the piece that's missing. It's about thinking of work, family, community as a system where everything is connected. And then you learn to pick out what you need to in the stories. Yes. So how does stress play into that then? Because you talk about toxic stress uh, in, yeah. in your LinkedIn page too. How would toxic, toxic, uh, toxic stress, uh, I don't want to say break off or, or uh, impact, say impact, uh, uh, this idea of stories or this idea of communication? Well, I think here, here's what happens. We have deep in us, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I've, I've done enough study about it to, to at least understand it to a certain point, is in the lower parts of the brain are all the old behaviors, all mm -hmm. the old patterns, which is what we call them. When stress hits the hot button, we end up reverting back to the patterns from childhood that were there to keep us to, to actually for survival. You know, we learned as kids, if there was a lot of screaming and yelling at home, some of us learned to go in and become the persecutor, the bully, the, the go in and, and get the parents away from each other. Others were the avoiders and went and hid under their beds. Mm -hmm. You know, so what we learn, and when stress is high, I've watched this over and over, people will, including you and I, revert back to that. Now, once we have enough emotional intelligence, we can say, ooh, I'm going back there again. I mean, I can still do drama queen, believe me. No. <laughs> but I do it quickly now. <laughs> <laughs> it dissipates much more uh, easily, I guess. Everybody's happy about that. I've asked a number of people this, and I, and I guess that uh, it becomes a regular question because so many leaders have it, and they're uh, uh, being an author or being a, a trainer. Uh, what are a few basic differences between men and women? Because that seems to be something that uh, has been talked about here on the campus. Um, uh, a number of people have been talking about there's these differences between, and, and yet I've had a couple people say there's not really any difference between leadership of men and leadership of women, but there's others that say, yes, there definitely is. Where do you fall within that area? Oh, there, there, there are differences. And, okay. it, you know, if you track back to, to hunters and gatherers, that's where this is very deeply embedded in us. And, and, you know, I mean, our genes came from somewhere. Mm -hmm. We kept inheriting from wherever. And, you know, there were the men were the, um, the hunters. And this is kind of interesting. So when they would go out hunting, what they had to do was zip it because they had to be quiet so that when they looked around to finally find the, whatever, the bear, the tiger, the buffalo, whatever they were going to kill, they didn't scare it away. So men tend to um, be more willing or able, I should say, to track situations in a quieter way. Women were the gatherers, and we went out in groups to um, gather the berries and the, and the herbs, and we talked with each other to scare away the little critters, the foxes and you know, whatever. So, you know, when I was a kid or my kids were kids, there was a little doll called Chatty Cathy. Yeah. yeah. And um, it, it, it was real. We do talk more. But here's what I teach. This is really interesting. There's research that shows that men don't use as many words as women do. So if you want to have a meeting with a man, do it in the morning while they still have more words. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's strange. Yeah. That's, that's very because strange. by the time a man comes home in the evening, you know, usually as they go into their home, they they want some time. They want to go into their cave for a while. Yeah. Whereas women want to keep going. So there are those differences. And one other difference that I think is really important is we as women were programmed for generations, eons, to be pleasers. And we're breaking out of it now. So I'm going to give you my formula, which I okay. think is so good, that as we as women become more daring, which is happening every day now, 
Uh, men have the room to become more caring because they don't have to hold the space to be daring all the time. So here's the formula. Daring plus caring equals sharing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very interesting. But how, what do you think of the impact is going to be then of all these, uh, <laughs> there's Fisky again, of all the, uh, the women who are beginning to step forward uh, for on the sexual harassment and sexual assault type of claims, uh, these people are stepping forward to becoming braver and braver. Uh, it seems to have started a, a sequence of other people coming out and being much more. How is that? How could that impact uh, leadership of by women in the future as well? Would they will they be as as quiet as before, uh, since they can see they can get results? from doing this now, they can also get results from speaking up on other topics as well. Women were quiet to stay alive. All right. You know, I mean, there was, you go back in history and you start to look at, um, and I don't like to use this term that often, but the patriarchy, uh -huh. you know, the whole idea of men being in charge. Um, often, if women didn't behave and do what they were told, they, they could be, you know, raped was one thing, but beaten and killed. Mm -hmm. So we learn to shut up. It's, it's the world is becoming different. I think with all the good and bad of social media, it, it's elevated us to be able to speak out more. And, you know, the internet and, and places like LinkedIn and, and Inc., you know, there, there are lots of good places to be able to speak out. Uh, I think that the whole model, the whole issue of sexuality and where it goes, we were just, no bragging, it was just a great trip. We were in uh, Cabo over uh, the holiday, over New Year's. And on the plane coming back, I watched the, the movie with Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs. Oh, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen that the yet. Battle, I'd like to. It, it's quite good. You know, okay. they did a really good job. But it took me back to think, my God, we've moved so far from there. But that was that oh, was yeah. the most viewed tournament on on television, I yeah. guess, in the days. Mm -hmm. And what it took to um, to break that men are stronger, better, and women are just meant to make dinner. So, do you think as 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 time advances now, will will women become more? brave, I guess, to break out of the shell and, and, and will that result in men starting to, to still call them uh, too forward, you know, because if, if a woman becomes, if a man becomes very pushy or daring, he's, you know, he's, uh, he's just being a man. If a woman becomes that way, she's being a you know the B word or something like that. Well, but, Cheryl Sandberg said it best: "Bossy." <laughs> okay, bossy sounds. That sounds like a that good B word. word. Yeah. yeah, that's a good. That's a good word. So, but but will women be? A, would you think that 2018 is kind of a turning point that women will become maybe more bossy and and the bossiness will drop as far as being bossy and actually just be leaders. I think we're at a turning point in so many ways. And with relationship, with male-female relationships, we're in the process of redesigning what they mean. And how do we parent? You know, I, again, it's another book I wrote called Gutsy, How Women Leaders Make Change. What I do, it's really for women, although the men who have read it said, thank you, it makes me understand my coworker, my wife, my daughter better, but it goes through the stages from pre-birth, you know, did you want a girl or a boy, you know, what happened when a girl baby was born, you know, the whole thing about pink and blue, blah, blah, blah. I think we're at a place where we're starting to ask the other questions. You know, one of them is, what's the difference between child care and caring for children? Okay. That's a big one. Child care yeah. is I That's drop a, them yeah. off over yeah. there and I pick them up over there. And there is a difference now that's happening in terms of balancing how we take care of boys and girls. We're teaching boys to be more 
more observant and generous and they're, they're still going to have their t- testosterone. They're still going to want to, you know, tussle around. But I have, I have a granddaughter. It's interesting. I've been watching her and how my daughter, her mother is training her or teaching her. And uh, she, she happens to be not because she's my granddaughter. It just is. She's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> what can I tell you? And uh, she, she just turned 12. Oh, and last year we were talking and she said, you know, grandma, my body belongs to me and nobody has a right to say or do anything that I don't agree with. Fantastic. I said, you go girl. (laughs) Yeah. And that's what, you know, her mother's been teaching her those kinds of things. So the, the next generation coming up, there's more equality, I believe. Uh, The changes are here. We need to sit and dialogue. My worry is that as women become more daring and women become stronger, that they're not going to include men in the dialogue. And the dialogue is where the action is. is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll have to leave it there uh, as uh, time is, is, is expired here. But it's been fascinating talking with you. I appreciate it so much and very interesting. I'd like to come back maybe again sometime uh, in the future and, and maybe talk a little bit more about a few things as well. Oh, I'd love to. And remember, you're going to take that quiz, the leadership quiz, and let me know what pattern shows up for you. Okay, I shall do that. Also, I want to, the the first book, well, let me give you a few seconds here. I always allow people to do uh, some kind of promotion of what they'd like to, t- to promote uh, as, as payment, you might say, for, for appearing on the, the campus. So please uh, take a few seconds here to uh, promote what you wish. Well, I want to promote pattern transformation. So that's my goal, is to help people break the old patterns that no longer work for them. One way is to go on www.ceoptions.com, take the quiz, get to us, ask questions. The other is, you know, the the book, Don't Bring It to Work, goes in, does a deep dive into uh, the patterns and how to transform them. Okay. Well, thank you so much again, and I will take that exam as soon as, we, as, soon as we're off the air here. Uh, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it greatly. Again, Dr. Silva, uh, Sylvia LaFair, uh, I appreciate it greatly. Take care of yourself. Thanks. Delight to be with you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.